How's everyone's night going so far? What a great event this has been. So I'm today talking about something I'm very passionate about, um, but I just want to offer a moment of vulnerability to you guys. When it comes to cars, can anyone relate to this picture right here? I can definitely relate. Um, I know some basic things about cars, and I know that every so often the light comes on indicating that the gas is low and I should probably go get gas. Um, my husband would say I shouldn't let it get to that point, but I like to live life on the edge. I know every 3,000 miles or so you should probably get an oil change, but when it comes to that strange rattling noise that the car makes, that's where I'm lost. Um, and that's when I should probably go see a mechanic. The thing is about going to a mechanic is they could tell me anything and I would have to believe them because I'm desperate to figure out what's going on and be able to drive um, away. So I really think that going on a diet is a lot like a trip to the mechanic. Sometimes you're so desperate for a solution, so desperate to figure out what's going on that you're willing to do just about anything. So today I am here to help guide you through the murky waters of diet trends and help to empower you with tools that will help to live, to help you live a lifetime of good health. So we're going to be weighing the pros and cons of some of the more popular diet trends today. And without further ado, we're going to be talking about the ketogenic diet. Anyone heard of this diet before? Yeah, a lot of you guys. And you're probably wondering, is it good, is it bad? So we're gonna talk about that. Does anyone remember the Atkins diet? Raise of hands. This is the Atkins diet on steroids. So it gives literal sense to an apple a day where about 30 to 50 grams of carbs, it's what allotted on the ketogenic diet, also called the keto diet. So it's very low carb. Um, just to give you ki kind of an understanding on a traditional diet, the recommendation for carb is based on your, your gender as well as your um, activity level and a few other factors. Um, but anywhere between 45 grams to 100 grams of carbs is what's recommended per meal. So this is per day and that's per meal. Um, so very, very low carb. And physiologically what's happening on your body um, on, a, on a keto diet versus a traditional diet. So if you have a traditional diet, you're getting your fuel source from carbs that turn into glucose when they hit the bloodstream. And that's what helps to fuel your brain and your body to move and do what you need to do. Um, with the keto diet, the carbs are restricted, so you're using your fuel from your fat stores. Those fat stores are basically being converted into ketones, and those ketones are fueling your brain and your central nervous system. So a lot of people experience this two to three week period on the keto diet, and it's known as the keto flu. Um, and the keto flu is basically where you're kind of getting used to this new fuel source, and so you're gonna have symptoms like constipation, um, decreased concentration, brain fog, or hanger as I like to call it. Anyone experienced hanger before? That's kind of what you experience this two to three week period on the keto diet. So in the short term, why are people losing weight on the keto diet? Well, there's a couple of different things that are happening on the keto diet. Basically, when you have higher fat in your diet, you're actually helping to turn off some of the hunger hormones that um, pop up every now and then um, when you're feeling hungry. So that fat in the diet is um, keeping you full. And then another reason is, um, um, there's limited food choices with the keto diet. So a lot of people are wind up restricting their overall calories and that's what is helping them lose weight. So long-term studies with the keto diet, there aren't many around. So it's hard to say what the implications or benefits are. Um, and I just have a couple red flags with this one. Um, if you're getting all of your, your fat from bacon and meat and cheese and butter and your coffee, people do that, and ranch dressing all over your salad, that's a high diet of saturated fat intake, and that can actually increase your risk for developing cardiovascular disease. So just kind of gotta be careful and definitely talk with a registered dietitian if this is the plan that you wanna do, um, so you can go about it in the most safe way. 
elimination diets. So I feel like every time uh, New Year's rolls around, there's like a new elimination diet, but essentially there's examples like Whole30, Paleo, sugar-free, carb-free. You're essentially eliminating certain food groups and you're allowing certain food groups in the plan. Um, and so two things that kind of raise red flags to me in this one is when grains and legumes are are a no food group, those are highly nutritious food groups. And if you guys heard me talking earlier with my hummus demo, fiber is awesome. <laughs> fiber is what keeps you full at a meal, it also helps to keep you regular. And so when you're restricting those specific food groups, um, you are restricting some of your fiber intake that is linked to decreased rates of chronic disease. Another red flag for me is I don't know about you guys, but when somebody says no to me, I want that even more. And so for a lot of people, they're, they're saying, I can't have this food, and when they finally do have this food, they just go crazy. So you gotta be careful if you feel like a diet is gonna affect you in your food relationship like that, maybe this isn't the right one for you. Then there's intermittent fasting. This one's a hot one right now, I feel like. Um, there are a lot of different plans, but really kind of what it boils down to is you're um, eliminating food for a period of time. And so there's different types of intermittent fasting. There's alternate day fasting where you're going not consecutively um, fasting. And then modified fasts where you're um, decreasing your amount of calories, maybe 500 on the fasting days. And then time-restricted fasting where you're going 8 to 12 hours um, fasting in that time frame. So with this diet, um, again, there aren't a lot of long-term um, studies to suggest what the implications or benefits are to the body, but I kind of have two um, thoughts on this one too. I have a client that is doing the time-restricted fasting, and she brought up a really good point that I just want to highlight, and she said, you know, I'm doing the time-restricted fasting, and the time frame that I am eating, I'm making a lot more mindful choices. So I'm not snacking, you know, when I'm just feeling bored, or I'm not eating into 2 a.m. in the morning. And for me, it's been a very helpful plan to help, you know, make, make more mindful choices, make more healthy eating choices. So for her, um, it sounds like it works pretty well. Again, with this one, if your, your food relationship is affected, like on your non-fasting non days, you view everything as an all-you-can-eat buffet, where you're eating pop candy cookies, cake, everything under the sun, um, then again, this might not be the best plan for you as well if your food relationship is going to be affected. And then there's the detox. So luckily for you and luckily for me and our budgets, our body comes with its own detoxification system in the form of the kidneys, colon, and liver. It is those organs' jobs to detoxify the body. If you guys want to support a natural detox, drinking water is a really great start. We have some infused water that was outside. Did anyone try that? Super good. I love it. Apple, cinnamon this time of the year. Oh, I could just drink so much, and then I have to go to the bathroom every five minutes, so... Um, and then eating at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, it's like a natural, mi natural multivitamin um, that can really help as well as getting you enough fiber. So I told you guys I love fiber. Um, most Americans are only getting 15 grams of fiber a day, whereas the recommendation for women is 28 grams a day. So that can definitely help with you feeling full as well as keeping you regular. Um, just want to talk about kind of like a public service announcement for some of these more trendy diets. There are populations of people that need to be very careful about trying any of these diets and definitely need to ask a doctor or talk to a doctor and a dietitian before going on it. And those people are women who are pregnant, breastfeeding, um, individuals who are on medications, um, chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes. Um, and yeah, so those groups of people definitely need to talk with their doctor before trying anything because some of these could potentially be harmful. All right, so why do diets fail? Maybe you guys have tried some of these diets and haven't had success. Maybe some of you guys have had success. And so I don't want to discount you guys who have found success with some of these diets. I think that's awesome. But for 95% of people, diets fail. And so I want to talk about why do diets fail? It's not you that failed. It's the diet that failed you. And we're going to talk about why that is. 
It's called weight cycling. So maybe this might sound familiar to you, to you guys, but you go on a diet for hope of a new life, or at least fit back into those 80s leather pants. Anyone? <laughs> Mom, was that you? <laughs> and so you restrict food and lose weight. And it's all fun at first, and maybe people are complimenting you, and maybe you're um, starting to feel better, but all of a sudden, if you're losing weight too fast, your metabolism could slow down. And there's a real reason for that, physiologically speaking. We have hormones that are kind of like a thermostat in our body, and all of a sudden, if we're losing weight too fast, they're like, oh no, this is not happening, we're gonna turn up that hunger hormone so you feel hungry, and you want more food, because our bodies are kind of designed to um, survive starvation periods. They don't understand that we're in the 21st century now, and we have a grocery store on every corner, so that's what's happening. And then, anytime we do put a calorie into our body, it holds onto it really tight and stores it as fat, because again, our body doesn't realize that we're just, we're on a diet. We're not starving. And then, you're at a social event or you're at Thanksgiving and you've been depriving yourself of food so long and you see cake across the room and one bite, you're just gonna have one bite is what you tell yourself and one bite turns into 50 bites and all of a sudden you are eating everything in sight and that's when that binge eating pattern happens and you're like, you know what? I, I'm so, I feel so shameful and guilty for all of this and you're like, screw this diet, I'm going off the diet. And then, I said screw, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and then potentially more weight gain can happen. And about two thirds of people when they go on diets, they wind up weighing more than when they started. And that can lead to its own, um, its own health implications as well. So there are a lot of things out there that can sound flashy and can be um, oversimplifying some things that go on. So you gotta just make decisions for yourself if it is the best plan for you. But there are other options out there that are less restrictive and can lead to a lifetime of good health. But just for a brief period, I wanna talk to you guys about my definition of a lifetime of good health. This is my grandma, her name's Leah Bell. She is a mother of seven children, 28 grandchildren, and five great grandchildren. And I think the fact that she walks around every day on the farm and puts flaxseed in everything and makes the best salads ever um, definitely has helped her reach her ripe age of 85 years old today. 83, sorry. Um, but realistically speaking, there are groups of people around the world, and they are calling these places blue zones. And blue zones are places in the world where people are really living to be old ages. I'm talking like 95 to 110. And they're not just living, but they're living, they're thriving um, with really low rates of chronic disease. And so researchers have been like, what is the recipe to what you guys are doing? And they're noticing it's lifestyle factors that are all in common. And so we're gonna look at the nutrition piece of their lifestyle factors. And at the heart of it all is plant-based eating. So all of the things that I've listed under plant-based eating are focusing on high intakes of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, and fruit. I already said fruit, but anyways. Um, high, minimally processed, plant-based foods. And I say eating pattern versus diet. Eating pattern is something where you choose different foods and the frequency in which you consume them. A diet is something you go on to lose weight. So I want you guys to understand the difference between the two. All right, so here are some of the health benefits for plant-based eating. And I'm not just saying there's short-term studies done on mice. There's long-term studies on people that say following a plant-based eating style is going to give you a multitude of these health benefits. I think that's pretty awesome. So we're just gonna go through some of these plant-based eating styles and just talk about what they are and what they offer. The vegetarian slash vegan diet, obviously there's a lot of different types out there, but again, whole minimally processed plant-based foods are going to offer you those benefits. I say whole because a french fry is considered vegan but a, a diet high in french fries and other refined foods isn't gonna get you the health benefits you like. 
And then just a side note to the vegan diet, if you do decide to do that one, definitely talk with a registered dietitian as well to ensure that you're meeting um, the right nutrients that you need for that. Then there's the Mediterranean diet. I talked a little bit about that during my hummus demo. Um, but basically, anywhere along the Mediterranean Sea, um, people are living to um, have less rates of chronic disease. And again, it's a plant-based eating style um, with veggies, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, and olive oil. Dairy products, fish, and poultry are consumed in low to moderate amounts. And meat and added sugar is limited. And eggs are consumed zero to four times a week. And added benefit, wine is available on this plan. Yeah. So for women, it's five ounces per day. Um, and what they're noticing is the red wine is offering a component called resveratrol. And resveratrol has antioxidants. And I'll be talking a lot about antioxidants. Um, and I think Dr. Dupree also talked about some of those antioxidants too. But um, antioxidants are things, well, she talked about exercise and how it has a decreased inflammation. But antioxidants also have this decreased inflammation to the body. And when you have decreased inf inflammation in the body, it can also decrease your risk for developing certain chronic diseases. Um, so the DASH diet is another one that they invented. It's a dietary approach to stop hypertension. And basically, for people who have high blood pressure, um, this is kind of the one that's recommended. And as you can see, compared to the Mediterranean diet, it's a little more prescriptive. So depending on what your calorie amount is, is how many daily servings of each of those food groups would be recommended. Another big um, difference between the Mediterranean and the DASH is um, there is more fat, dietary fat, on the Mediterranean diet coming from that olive oil. And then if DASH and Mediterranean were to get married and have a baby, it would be called the MIND diet. And this is actually a fairly new one. Um, they invented it in 2015. So may maybe you guys have heard it, maybe you haven't. But this one's pretty interesting. Um, so again, it's focusing on whole minimally processed foods and limiting saturated fat, red meat, sodium, and added sugar. And this Chicago Health and Aging Project has been gathering a lot of information for the last 20 years. And they've been looking at specific dietary patterns um, that have a potential lowering effect on developing um, Alzheimer's disease, lowering the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So what they did was they developed this MIND diet and then um, studied 900 people for 4.5 years and wanted to see what their um, risk for developing Alzheimer's disease would be. So they had people go um, and have two or more servings of vegetables a day, including at least one leafy green vegetable, because they believe the leafy greens help, to, um, help, help with brain health. And then berries, two or more servings per day. And berries instead of fruit, because berries are higher in antioxidants, like I talked to you guys before about antioxidants and their effects. And blueberries also have a high amount of antioxidants, so they were encouraged. And then whole grains, two or more servings per day. Nuts, five or more servings per week. Beans, four or more servings per week. Seafood, one or more servings per week. And then they also encourage fatty fish because fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, and herring um, offer the body omega-3 fatty acids. And that's, again, a component that has been linked to um, decreased inflammation in the body. And then poultry, two or more servings per week. So what they found was people that followed this diet rigorously for 4.5 years had a 53% reduction in risk for Alzheimer's disease. And those that followed it moderately had a 35% reduction in risk for Alzheimer's disease. That's pretty powerful. Someone better sign me up for that meal plan. So I get asked this question a lot in my field, what is the best diet? And I really don't think it's black and white. Um, but I really think that it needs to be something that you can sustain for a lifetime. It includes the foods that you like. If it includes foods you don't like, how sustainable is that going to be? Um, and, in, and you enjoy it with friends and family. There's a huge cultural and social component that food has that I don't think we should ignore. Lots of color variety satisfies the hunger and appetite. And then from what the research we just looked at, I, I believe that it incorporates vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes. And then movement is important, too. You can't just have healthy eating without movement. 
Um, those are so important to have together. And then I just want to end with a few lasting notes for you guys. I think that we as women, we have a knack of putting everyone else's needs before our own. And at the end of the day, we don't really pay attention to our health or wellness or anything like that. One wise woman once said to me, you can't set yourself on fire to keep everyone warm. That's so powerful. And I think that it's important to put your, it's, it's important to invest in yourself and your health and wellness. And it's probably a lot cheaper than it is in a, than investing in a car. And you guys know how I feel about cars. <laughs> and then last note is, I know that all of these all of these lifestyle factors, it can be overwhelming at times, and sometimes you want something that's gonna give you results really fast. But I think in the long term, small, simple changes over time is what's gonna really add up to a lifetime of good health. And then these are some resources, but if you ever wanted like more than just three resources, I have a ton for you guys. So we could always meet one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I love talking to people about their nutrition goals and talk about what we can do to come up with a plan. And then if you would also like to be supported um, by a lifestyle medicine practitioner, Dr. Murphy is accepting patients and would love to support you with your journey as well. All right, thank you guys. Do you have any questions for me?